Hello, um, I'm Shafali Begum. Um, I have a daughter who has um, EDS, kyphoscoliotic type 6, and today I'll be talking about her. Um, in profession field, I'm a counsellor and a psychology student and wish to pursue my career in counselling for a uh, long term. So, yeah. Um, I'm Aminor, I'm the uh, second oldest in the family, uh, Sarah's older brother. Um, I am a master's student in maintenance engineering. Uh, after I complete my studies next year, I intend to go into uh, awareness and hopefully building something amazing on behalf of my late sister. Hello, Shifali and uh, Amin. My name is Francisca Malfe. I'm a clinical geneticist in Ghent in Belgium. And I would like to thank you very much for um, wanting uh, to take this interview uh, on behalf of, uh, of your um, daughter and uh, sister, Sarah. Um, so could you uh, perhaps start a little bit by uh, telling us what condition that Sarah suffered from? When she was about four, that the diagnosis changed and they said that the previous one didn't fit. So the new diagnosis was the um, Ehlers Danlos Syndrome type 6. And in order to get this diagnosis, they uh, conducted a muscle biopsy. And this uh, show, uh, showed the evidence to um, the type 6. I see. Yeah. So, yeah, ever since uh, we knew that she was very delicate and then, you know, it was quite difficult. Uh, even dressing her up was quite a hard work because um, I just had to take more time compared to my other children. Uh, her hands being floppy and, you know, soft. So, um, yeah, but uh, from that moment onwards, I just knew she's my <laughs> perfect baby. So I just was really overwhelmed with her being born and the whole condition. It was like a journey for me to learn. And um, it was emotional as well. At the time, I didn't really know very much. And the information, what they would or they did give was uh, not, you know, how you can get a lot of access to Google and how everything is nice and clear. About 2018 years ago, she's so by the time she got her diagnosis, she was four. So about say 17 years ago, they would uh, talk to us, give us some information, print the, a handbook handout, and then you just go away. And then they'll just um, if we ask them questions, there isn't really much answers. They said that she was very uh, fragile; she can fracture herself, so we have to be careful of that. She was vulnerable to falls. And um, yes, I mean, if I could ask you, yeah, as a sibling, yeah. um, could you could you tell us a little bit how it affected your life living with with a sister with a chronic rare condition? Um, at first, we we all knew about it when we were young, um, but we didn't really like we just all like didn't see her as. Like, like we didn't categorize her in another category. We just yeah. like saw her as our sister. Yeah. Uh, just did everything together from young growing up. Um, as like the years went on, it got more difficult and we had to be a bit more creative creative in what we had to do to yes. kind of please her. So it got to a point, I think, um, like going out in the car together was really like fun for her. Um, just spending time in a room on a daily basis after work, before work, uh, was like, highly like crucial for her. I think just um, last year during the lockdown, um, I bought her the, the Nintendo Switch because she wasn't, like, she's not into, like, the PlayStation, so I got her that, then it kind of <laughs> got her playing, and you can do, like, four players and stuff on the Olympic Games, so we all kind of got on, right like, really well at the end. Uh, just... To finish off, I'd say she's like someone from like the future because she kind of planned everything ahead. Uh, she kind of knew mm -hmm. what like was going to happen in terms of like, what she wanted to do and why. So, yes, yeah, just been a blessing. Yes, yes. 
So in, in your experience as a, as a family having a child with a, with a rare disease, did you feel that help, health practitioners were like knowledgeable about this condition uh, or EDS even in general? Or did you have to teach them? It's hard to say because um, it, um, it got to a point where she knew more. She had to teach them. Yeah, fact. Like she, yeah. Knew, she, she knew more than most people. She, she knew more than yeah. the consultants, doctors. So uh, every time so we were in the hospital, so even when we go to see the review to genetics and, you know, all the orthopedic for certain part of her body, uh, she would explain everything. She knew everything A to Z, how it worked and every little bit really. So she's a self-advocate, I would say, yes. so yeah. about herself, her medical condition. And in terms of what you said about knowledgeable and the uh, uh, clinicians, physicians, doctors, experts, uh, I feel they are not knowledgeable and lots needs to be changed for future because EDS has been neglected really badly throughout history, I'd say. And mm -hmm. it was very difficult emotional for us because after Sarah had a spinal surgery in 2014, that's when everything affected her, her teenage life. Because every time, you know, she's lot, wrote a lot of um, statements for us in her mobile and it's very emotional now that when we read everything, yeah. it's like a book she's made for us. And it's, we just feel upset, cry and think so you know, this is how her life is like a book. Although she was open with us to some limits, but she often used to hide her emotions. But I think everything affected her from her spinal time when he had when she had the scoliosis, yes. the correction, age 12 onwards. And that was the time where, you know, for girls and boys, you have that second stage of life of growth development, reaching towards adolescence. You know, it's that age. Uh, so that affected her badly at that time and um, she like I said she recalls her memory her childhood memory as the best memory of life and we've got a lot of recordings of her I mean we her dad is more into camera and technology so ever since she was small and um, our boys we always used to record our family yes. uh, uh, videos together so we have a lot of video and just before she died, she watched the videos and then she recalls, you know, the way she was walking and her hands and everything. And she says, oh, mom, I think I do walk like that because it supports me. So when she's walking, it's her structure and yeah. the supporting and balance. So in that sense, um, she um, was very knowledgeable and self-explored her own problems. So as time went by, like I mean, I was saying um, that the last couple of years, she in fact got all her medical problems out, evaluated, and then would explain it to the specialist. Uh, yet she does explain to the specialist well, but when the specialist, you know, like all from different fields that's involving uh, rheumatology and and I said orthopedic, ophthalmology, uh, immunologist, uh, also for POTS syndrome. I'm not sure the name of the doctor, but uh, he diagnosed with heart issues. Yes. Uh, it was herself, she would explain to them what her problem is. Yes. And then after she explains the review she gets back from the doctor's point of view, it contradicts, it changes. And what she could understand is that she used to say they don't understand the EDS body. I think they compare it with the normal body, you know, the evaluation. Yes. Say yourself, myself, and any other normal people. We might have problems you know, if we had pods or, I don't know, all the pain issues and what makes us to stay in the bed. But when she gets the evaluation back or the feedback from the doctor, it's as though the report is very different, the statement. An example to that is, um, uh, like I won't mention the name, but it's from one of the recent doctors and she took all the information and then the feedback that was given to Sarah, that made her very upset and it discouraged her because it was saying rather that she's badly deconditioned, 
and lazy. So basically you're lazy then, you're in the bed, you're badly deconditioned. But Sarah had a lot of problems. So like I said, she has the type six EDS connective tissue disorder resulting extreme um, uh, dis dislocations, fragile skin, um, so many she said, and then she had um, gastrology issue as well as um, often eye issues, her eyes can detach, uh, her arteries can rupture, um, her head as well, it was unstable. So yeah. as, as a child, so I'm kind of, as a child, she, when she was born, that was detected just recently, about six months ago, prior to her upright MRI, that back of the head, it wasn't formed. Sometimes. Yes. So again, her, she was quite a, what, well, how can I explain, like a, not a very, strong baby but yeah. she was strong but quite very uh, fragile and as so she's been delicate. Before, delicate yeah yeah so yeah so in that sense um in terms of doctors we had a uh, bad is um, um, uh, traumatic issues with a and &E. she would have to explain everything about her condition a to z and by the time she explained everything she was out of breath so yeah. If you know what I mean, so she was tired out of breath because if she doesn't tell everything, then they won't know how to. Even you know, inserting a cranula, yes. that was difficult because they couldn't find the pain. They would make about several attempts, which is not nice. So all that really affected Sarah in terms of her yes. depression, mental health issues, mm -hmm. and she was like slowly going down. It's like is everything together. So she had about nine or 10 or probably 15 diagnoses. So I don't know if you heard of MCAS. Uh, before she died, that developed. And any food she ate, uh, one day she's okay, then after a few days, that gave a reaction. So then we got, we, she used to use cetrizine, that didn't help. So then another medication was given and that was quite strong. So I think that helped at the end just before she passed away. Um, she had gastrology issues, ongoing colitis. And I think this had made her into being bed bound. Uh, it started from November 2019, one day. And she just started with diarrhea, blood loss and uh, feverish and everything. So we quickly took her to a and &E, um, a and &E, uh, did some tests she stayed about a couple of days and they treated her with antibiotics did a ct scan and that's when they said that they've seen some inflammation in her colon and ever since that went on so that issue went on throughout the lockdown so like i said 2019 november everything started yeah. throughout the lockdown um not, we didn't get any referrals because the hospital said that when they were discharging her, that she should get something from the endoscopy team or the gastroenterology team uh, by six weeks and so on. We didn't get this. We waited three months. So we called the GP and then the GP uh, referred her to the endoscopy team. And when the endoscopy team did uh, send something, it was at least over six months. And then when we explained to them that Sarah can't have an endoscopy, it's not very suitable for her mm -hmm. to insert uh, the, the whole procedure. So that's when they didn't know what to do. We went at least three to four hands specialist. It's been like past the parcel from one hand to another. And at the end, when they you know review her condition, it's like they're just scared. They just don't know what to do, yes. how to treat her. Yes. And this is the problem Sarah had. And until the end, she herself, because she was very gifted in education, and uh, she wanted to be a neuroscientist, uh, she herself found something about the capsule imaging, which is very interesting. So she thought that's the only way if they want to get into her, you know, gastro side and examine her. That's the only way probably is the safe. Uh, so she's the one who referred that to the doctor and the doctor said, OK, we'll refer you to Newcastle again. And then she was on the waiting list referral. And, you know, the appointment came after she died on the 18th of April. We received the package 
of this capsule imaging. So that was too late. And you see my point. So the negligence and the way things have been going yeah. uh, wasn't nice. And my issue, my, um, what I would like to say to everyone and all the ETS people, and that includes people, specialists, doctors, and um, me the medical side, that please um, don't compare themselves with normal bodies. And these problems with EDS, uh, and especially with the very rare attack, it can um, rapidly uh, progress and affect to different parts of the body, the lungs and liver and, well, different, I mean, organs. And uh, things can quickly really um, progress and result uh, to severe problems. And this is what has happened to my daughter. We didn't know she's going to have a liver failure and we thought it was suspected colitis. And there's been no treatment for over one and a half years. So perhaps normal people may handle it, but not a person like that. They have muscle weakness. She's yes. been deteriorating, losing weight. So more, you know, attention should have been put on that. And I really wish more attention is put to those people in different parts of the world with uh, EDS patients. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that message. Uh, just to end, I mean, is there anything you would like to say about your sister? She sounded like a wonderful person from what um, I hear. Yes, yeah, just like she wanted to do like quite a lot of things um, in terms of awareness and fundraising. So like I will be carrying on that for her and just spread a loud message. And um, it's already spread quite a lot on social media through like TikTok especially. Um, are like uh, probably like almost a million views just based on her story. So it's, uh, it's yeah. really powerful. So uh, yeah, we'll just keep doing that I for her. She, about the um, yeah. yeah, she had that. Um, she did the uh, like beauty pageants um, for Miss really? Universe. And her initial message was to bring her story mm -hmm. of her condition well, really. Asian yeah, an Asian community, especially because they're not really aware. And if like if she did go on to the international stage, she would have brought more um, worldwide. worldwide. So yes, she had a lot of plans, but yeah, we'll try and do what we can from where we are now. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. That was um, really very uh, very nice of you to share that story and and also for the message that you give the medical community. So. Well, good luck. And uh, again, my condolences with the loss of, of Sarah. fragile so the retina can detach causing me to be blind. Joint hypermobility causing dislocations. I have dislocations every single day. My bones are very loose. My hands are floppy so everything is floppy. my princess, my only daughter. She has taught me a lot. She has taught dad a lot, the whole family a lot. Because without her condition, I wouldn't know a lot about these hidden disability and how it worked. Everybody's equal. Her message was that every human, everybody's life matters and everybody's equal. We should not judge others just by external factors. Just because somebody can walk a little on the good days, or looks okay on the outside does not mean their illness is non-existent. She wanted doctors, nurses, clinicians, physicians 
specialist to educate, especially with that condition, and mainly it was doctors and nurses in a and &E, uh, because every time she was admitted, they didn't know anything much about her condition. They would go on Google and find out which wasn't the very best because you don't get that connection if that doctor's not fully aware. The nurses, often when they looked at her, they judged her by thinking, oh, you don't need your mom. She can go home and all this. So that used to be really frightening for her. Invisible illnesses are very much real and disabling. My message to everybody is to educate yourself before judging somebody else's pain and suffering. She was your typical straight A student. Sarah was a person who had it all. She was beautiful, she was bright, she was smart, she was funny. All right, everyone. Say cheese. Say cheese. Say cheese. Say cheese. Say cheese.